Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for, for coming to my talk. and main interest is in compiler technology, that I use it and extend it to tackle research problems coming from the underlying architecture. My simple task is to look at the hardware side of compilers, to identify opportunities to design them, to find existing, uh, exist, existing interfaces that we have across these layers. Today, I'm going to describe one, one research of this kind. I'm going to describe techniques that show how to efficiently parallelize sequentially designed programs to target multi-core architecture that we have today. But before jumping into the specific techniques that I designed, first I would like to remind why automatic parallelizing compilers are so important now more than ever. In the 90s, early 2000s, we, we experienced an exponential growth of CPU frequency that allowed us to boost dramatically the performance of sequentially designed programs. And I still remember back then when I bought a new computer, I was always fascinated to see how well it performed, how faster my sequential programs run, run in the new machine. But today is no longer the case because we hit the power wall that forced the industry to block the CPU frequency. Now, sequentially designed programs do not accelerate as they used to. In exchange, we have a lot of cores in a single chip. But most of these cores today are underutilized because fundamentally, we don't have enough explicit parallelism in a single application because developing parallel code is much harder. It's much harder to de develop parallel code, debug it, maintain it. That's why today, after 10 years that we are in the multi-core era, sequentially designed code is still used. You may think that you can, you can use multiple programs to take advantage of all of these cores we have in a single chip. So in servers, this is true, this is the case. But in client devices, in your mobile phone, in your laptop, it turns out that most of us run f a few CPU-intensive applications, often even just one. So on one hand, we have sequentially designed code that are ubiquitous still. On the other hand, we have a lot of these cores in a single chip, which is hardware resources that right now we are not taking advantage of. Sorry, that, sorry. yes? Develop uh, parallel code to take advantage of uh, the multiple cores we have in a single chip that they can exploit fine grain parallelism that for a human being is hard to describe because it's just time consuming. And my key insight is exactly this, is that there is enough fine grain parallelism across threads that can be generated by a compiler to take advantage of all, all of these cores in a single chip. And thanks for the question. Uh, so that's why now, more than ever, it's so important to have these parallelizing compilers available and we need to make them mainstream. And this is what this talk is about. But before jumping into the techniques, I would like to take a few seconds to describe which kind of sequentially designed code we should focus on, which one we should parallelize. Because on one hand, we have what is called numerical program or regular programs. And we know how to handle this because they have regular control and data flow. So the compiler at compile time can infer where the execution will go at runtime and how data will flow through the code. Leveraging this information, today's compiler can already start, yeah. Uh, in the code, then we know how to parallelize them. But I agree, and thank you for the point, because we can handle these programs, but the majority of the cases, we have irregularity in the code. And therefore, it's not easy to parallelize them. Um, 
It is regularity versus irregularity because it depends how much information you can infer at compile time by a parallelizing compiler. That's the distinction. So but thanks for the point. Because for the rest, for the common case, for the rest of the programs called non-numerical, we have irregularity in the, in, the, in the program. Therefore, a compiler cannot infer at compile time where the execution will go at runtime or even how data will flow through the code. This makes the problem of automatically paralyzing this code much harder. And that's why my research focus on these programs. These are the target of my research. And the reason I'm so excited about this research and the value of it is that I, I'm going to show in the next 40 minutes that the class of programs we can parallelize today automatically is much broader that, than what we all assumed. So the first thing I did is take some samples of these non numerical programs, run them on today's systems to understand their execution. What I found is that obviously most of the time is spent in loops. So if we want to parallelize them, we need to parallelize their loops. A simple way to parallelize a loop is take the iterations of a loop and distribute them among the cores. Of course, often you have dependencies that carry across loop iterations. One way to handle them is called do across, which has been uh, an execution model proposed in the 80s and evaluated through the 90s where it takes, it clusters the code involved in this dependence in what is called a sequential segment. A sequential segment is the part of the iteration whose instances that spread across processors will be executed in the same original sequential order. And then we have the parallel segment, which is everything else. The performance obtained by do across comes from overlapping the parallel segment. If my first contribution is to look at this execution model and then adapt it for today's multi-core architectures that we can leverage the low latency we have across the course because of the optimized synchronization primitives we have today. So the first, the first approach I call Helix is take this sequential segment and split it in multiple sequential segments. This is equivalent to take a large critical section and cut it down in multiple smaller critical sections. Of course, we increase now a little bit of parallelism because now we overlap also different sections of the sequential segment. We also generate information because of overlap. In general, Helix takes the loop body and slices in multiple sequential segments, creating multiple parallel segments as well. Here we are talking about hundreds of sequential segments in a loop, and each one has few machine code instructions. The value of this approach is that now we don't rely just on the parallel segment to gain performance. And that's the key for non-numerical programs. Then we, we generate synchronization instructions around the sequential segment to orchestrate the execution around the course. So for example, in four cores, the execution will look like this. That's a way I parallelize a loop. However, these non-numerical programs don't have just one loop. They have an entire hierarchy of loops nested within each other. So the question is, which of these loops is more efficient in these two different cases? Because on one hand, we have outermost loops that include the majority of the code of the program. On the other hand, we have innermost loops that are smaller and include less code. So therefore, you may think that we, what we want to do is paralyze outermost loops because we have high coverage of the program. And by, the, by AMDA's law, we know this is good. The problem is that from a compiler perspective or from a compiler developer like myself, targeting outermost loop is a nightmare because they are very hard to understand because they include so much code that they have so many possible execution paths in the code that the compiler must understand to automatically paralyze it that it's very hard and it's challenging. And that's why also people thought that they couldn't be paralyzed, these outermost loops. I think I have a question. That's a great question. Um, I would argue that the language has an impact, but it's not the only factor. Because also you have overlapping factors in the code. They are not predictable, and yeah. But the language definitely has an impact. And that will tie it with the, uh, for the, at the end of my talk. But thank you for the question.
So from a compiler developer like myself, what I would like is to design code analysis and transformations that target the small loops, the one on the other end of the spectrum. The problem is that small loops, the innermost one, have a communication problem. Because if you have a dependence between these iterations that run in parallel, and you do have one, but you have more than one, then you have to perform some communication. And the cost of that will dominate the entire execution because small loops tend to have short iterations. So on one hand, you don't want to parallelize bigger loops. On the other hand, you don't want to parallelize small loops. That's why the first parallelizing compiler that I designed tend to parallelize could in loops in the middle ground. So the, fir the first question is, how well do we perform? By I built the compiler, and I took this, uh, the integer benchmark of the spec suite, which represents the, the non-numerical program space. I ran them on, today's, on a today's system, Intel Nehal M4 core. I took the time running them sequentially, and I called this spec baseline. The first thing I did was to take state-of-the-art industrial strength compiler, Intel, ICC, and Microsoft Visual Studio. They include parallelization techniques inside. So I tried to use them. And so you, you can do a combination of them. And I tried all sorts of combinations. What I found is that I couldn't extract any kind of parallelism from these programs. I also tried do across and st still no parallelism. Because the reason is because is that the parallel segment is small, is tiny in these loops. But now, if you slice the sequential segment in multiple sequential segments and you run them in parallel, you can boost the performance by more than double. I was very excited when I've seen this data. I was jumping up and down in the lab and they claimed success and they published a paper. Super happy. And then we bought a new computer with more cores in, in, in the chat. performance didn't improve. It was already saturated at four cores. That's why in the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on my key research insight, which is if you want to boost the performance of, of Helix, you, don't, you cannot just parallelize loops in the middle ground. You have to allow the compiler to include the parallelization of these smaller loops, where we have a communication challenge. That's why the subsequent two contributions that I'm going to talk about, they focus on small loops and how to parallelize them. And therefore, we have to handle the communication somehow. I call small loop parallelism this kind of parallelization. So I'm going to focus first on Helix RC, which are co-designed between the compiler and the architecture. So we said that we want to parallelize small loops, or also small loops. The problem is that we have a communication channel because they tend to have short iterations. So the first question is how short they are. What's the lifetime we are talking about here? So here you can see on the x-axis that the duration, the lifetime of these iterations. And on the y-axis is the fraction of these iterations that ends within a clock cycle. I ran them in a real system, executing these short iterations sequentially. For example, let's count how many iterations ends within 25 cycles. You can see that more than half of these iterations ends in this region. So these iterations are very short. Let's count how many, how many iterations end within 75 cycles, and you can see that the majority of them, 90%, are in this region. To put in perspective this number, 75, I measure the latency that we pay today to move one single byte be between adjacent cores in a single chip. I design a micro benchmark and run in multiple platforms. Here I show three different generations of Intel processors. And what you can see is that in, even in the optimistic case, we have to pay at least 75 cycles. This means that if we are, see, because we have at least one dependence between, sh between these short loop iterations, we have to satisfy them by moving at least one byte between adjacent cores. And the cost of doing that will supersede the entire execution, sequential execution, of the majority of these iterations. So if you try to run these short loop iterations in parallel in today's system, you will have a massive slowdown. And actually, we tried, and of course, this is what we obtained.
and cut it down to almost zero. That will liberate this parallel execution. And this is what Helix RC does. To do it, I propose a co-design between the compiler and the architecture. At the compiler level, we analyze the loops automatically. And we highlight the dependencies across iterations by including the involved code in multiple sequential segments, as we said before. Now, we introduce two new instructions in the ISA called waiting signal to highlight these boundaries, to allow the architecture to now understand what a sequential segment is, what a loop iteration is, and what a loop is. So we take all of this information and we propagate it down to the architecture piece that I call, that I call ring cache. Now you can see that the ring cache understands the structure, understands that the data that is generated within this code has to be propagated across the course. So now we can reduce the communication latency by moving data as soon as they get generated. I'm going to use an example to highlight the value of this architecture. But first, I want to point out the fundamental problem that we have today in today's system, the way we design, that does not allow us to obtain this almost zero latency. Core 0 is going to generate data that will be used by Core 1. So Core 0 generated data and stored it in memory to allow the propagation. So we store the value in the private cache L1. In the future, when Core 1 requires that piece of data, it issues the load instruction. And only at that time, the architecture realizes that needs, some communication has to happen. And therefore, the architecture goes through the entire cache hierarchy multiple times to identify where the data is, fetch it, and bring it back to the local private cache L1. In this way, the core will have access to it. But it was too late. This cost us at least 75 cycles. So we cannot be reactive like this. We need to proactively distribute the data as soon as they get generated. And this is what I propose. I didn't want to redesign the entire architecture from scratch because we have a lot of knowledge that we built in the last 10 years to, to build this kind of system. So I want to make a light enhancement of this architecture. So what I propose is to add one ring node per core. The purpose, yes. Great question, thank you. Um, irregularity. It's very hard to predict. That's why it's, it's not. But thank you for the question. That was brilliant. Um, OK, so. instructions. It's very hard to push stuff around. So again, this is a fun yes. Sorry. So, so this is, again, an, a limitation due to this kind of, uh, of code. Um, great question. Um, there is a challenge, which is we're talking about small loops. Therefore, we have um, some iterations, but these, these small loops, they get uh, invoked multiple times. And they get interleaved between each other. So therefore, the prefetcher has to learn the pattern pretty fast, or we will pay this overhead. And even if you pay in the 
first quarter of the iterations, you will still slow down quite a, while, quite a lot. So, but it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Maybe they, it's a certain degree they will have to be here. But in what I'm proposing here, I know. The problem is the irregularity because Cruzero doesn't know if that Core 1 will actually use that data for all sorts of reasons. And when you have, for example, 16 cores, you have to push it eventually to all of them. But if you run the code, like say, in a chaotic way, you don't know who is going to use it first. But if compilers shape the execution in a predictable way, you are shaping the data such that you will be forwarded around the course, and you can take advantage of that. And this is Helix RC. Yes? Does that broadcast uh, mechanism costs in area, power, and is here what I'm proposing is a delayed broadcast that follows the execution of these iterations that are shaped by the compiler. But, but if, if we can have a very cheap and instantaneous broadcast mechanism, I wouldn't publish this, <laughs> this work. But yeah. Um, okay, so, so um, we have this ring node. And the purpose of this ring node is to store the data that will be, will be used by other cores or shared data. We know that this data will be generated within sequential segments. And this is why data that are generated within that code will be stored in this ring node. Now for this example, I want to complicate it a little bit more and use four cores. And because we know that we will distribute iterations in a ring fashion among them, I propose to connect this ring node to some of the other ones. A good analogy, yes. Yes, thanks. Um, so now we connect this ring node in this way. So at, we distribute the iterations among these cores. The compiler analyzed this code and at compile time so that there could be a dependence between these two instructions. So it highlighted them to put them inside the sequential segments, surrounding them with waiting signal instruction. So when code here is executed, now the value gets stored locally and in parallel get distributed to the JSON ring node. This propagation happens in parallel with the computation of the course, and this is the key. So then when core zero issues a signal instruction, the signal as well gets propagated, and one step at a time, it gets propagated everywhere in parallel with the computation. So at the time the core, core one will issue the wait instruction, the only information it needs is the synchronization signal that is already available locally. So what we just did is we synchronized core zero and core one without paying any communication penalty. Also, when we issue the load instruction, we, just, we can access the data generated remotely, locally. And we did this we did without paying any communication penalty. So the communication latency perceived by core one, in this case, is zero. This is, of course, is in, it is an ideal scenario. And so the question is, how often this is the case? How often can we actually fully overlap the communication with the computation? So in this case, core one had something to do before issuing the wait instruction, for example, while the, while the data was generated and, and get across the entire chip. To do that, I build a simulator. And I simulate 16 Intel Atom cores 
configure the memory hierarchy in the same way we can find them in, in today's systems. And I add just one kilobyte of ring node per core. Notice that the size of the ring node I'm proposing to add in this chip is 32 times smaller than the private cache L1 we have. In this configuration, we have 98% hit rate, which means 98% of the time a core asks for either a synchronization signal or data generated within sequential segment, it will find it locally. Of course, you may think, well, this is great, but at the end of the day, we don't care about this. We care about performance. So give me performance. This is what we see in this slide. And the x-axis are benchmarks. And the y-axis is the performance obtained by Helix RC and Helix as well. So let me start first by showing the compiler-only solution. You can see that for numerical programs, a compiler-only solution can be pretty good already. We can parallelize these kind of regular programs. But for non-numerical programs, which is the contribution of my research, despite three years of effort of me and my colleagues, we couldn't parallelize them. Because fundamentally, we cannot run in parallel these short iterations. And therefore, we cannot parallelize these small loops. But now, if we, if we have this co-design, what suddenly what we can do is parallelize these small loops as well. And that boosts the performance significantly. But the contribution of Helix RC is on non-numerical programs, which is exactly the kind of programs today we don't have a solution for. I was super excited when I've seen this, and the first thing I did is calling my brother. And I said, he's not in CS, and I told him that I was able to accelerate programs quite significantly. The first thing he asked me was, where can I buy the computer with your ring tag? So while I wait Intel to improve the entire computer, I decided to look at, again, a compiler-only solution for non-numerical programs to see what can we do. And this is what I did when I designed HelixUp. The way to look at this research, HelixUp, is I wanted to understand the execution, the parallel execu execution generated by Helix from a different angle. So what I did was instead of behaving like a normal compiler that preserved the semantics at any cost, I wanted to understand if you don't do that, if we break a dependence, is it really true that everything will break down? Or maybe the program that they, they can tolerate some kind of data dependencies that get broken. And this is the contribution of Helix up to show this, to show that even if you start cheating around, breaking dependencies, reshuffle the code in an unsafe way, the code is not going to break down. It's going to be around for you to that. Also, of course, this kind of mentality cannot be applied for any program, but some workloads tolerate some output distortion. So we can take advantage of that. So what we can do is taking advantage of this toleration and allow the compiler to, other than just having semantics preserving code transformations, to have also semantics relaxing code transformations, or I call in the rest of the talk, relaxing transformations for brevity. but is orthogonal to the value, to the, the key insight of this research. So the relaxing transformation programs, including Helix, are designed to remove the bottlenecks we have in the parallel code generated by Helix to obtain ideal speed up. So the first question is, which kind of bottleneck we are talking about? And the first one, the most obvious one, is the sequential bottleneck, the one due to the dependencies. So for example, if you run iterations in this way, so thread one, execute iteration one, thread two, iteration two, and so forth. Now we have a sequential segment between instruction three and four because of the dependencies, dependence between instruction four and instruction three. Now, this is the helix execution, and you can see the bottleneck. These dependence create a sequential chain. So the most obvious thing to do is look at this code, identify the thread that is suffering the most, break the dependence that is blocking this thread, and then obtain significant performance by breaking one dependence. 
Of course, we can do, we can push this concept further, break another dependence, and now suddenly obtain ideal speed up. As you can see here, there is a spectrum of aggressiveness you have on breaking these dependencies. So this is an example of, of relaxing transformation for a sequential bottleneck, but we, we, this is not the only bottleneck we have. We also have communication bottleneck. This is due to just moving data around. This, we have a different set of relaxing transformation that simply change the code to skip some data movement. Finally, the less obvious bottleneck is the data locality log. When you run the sequential program sequentially, you run iterations sequentially, you have some data locality, spatial and temporal, that go across iterations. Now you distribute iterations around the course. Suddenly, you lost this kind of data locality, and this can block the performance. Here we have a third set of relaxing transformation that take iterations, slice them in different ways, in an unsafe way, and cluster them to regain a little bit of the, oh, the majority of this data locality loss. In general, we have a set of relaxing transformations, ranging a spectrum, ranging from we don't apply any relaxing transformation, and therefore we obtain baseline performance. But also, and also we don't have any output distortion. And then very aggressive relaxing transformation that breaks a lot of dependencies, gaining a lot of speed up, but also we, incre we increase the chances significantly to change the output quite aggressively. And everything in between. So the question is which one we should use and where we should apply for. So for this, I'm gonna use an example. Let's assume that we are parallelizing a very simple program that there are only two code regions that can lead to a bottleneck. So two sequential segments, for example. So region one is region two. Let's say that each one can be transformed and can have different transformations. Now, if you decide to apply relaxing transformation three to the code region one, and also relaxing transformation five to the second code region, you can see that you identify as a point in this design space we just created by having these relaxing transformations. The most obvious thing to do is characterize this point in performance obtained, energy saved, and the output distortion will be obtained in a, in a, a set of representative inputs. Then ideally, we would characterize all of the points here in the, inside the entire code region, inside the, the entire design space. So then when the user set the limits of uh, the output distortion, then the system can automatically infer the best configuration, the best way to generate the code to maximize performance or energy saved while uh, uh, validating the constraints set by the user. And then running this code, yes. Uh, great question. Um, I rely on, I, this, there is a fundamental assumption I'm making, which is I, I assume that we have representative inputs at compile time. Uh, this was the case. Um, if it, this is not the case, then we have to be a little bit smarter than that, but we have kind of a solution I'm gonna describe in a second. Yes. Yes. Um, great. Great question, the answer is yes. But in order to, um, um, uh, I, I look at this approach more like than, rather than having an actual product that can be used to understand how this, this panel execution look like. Is, is the assumption we are making that we break a dependence, everything breaks, is really true? And is not. This is the way I look at Helix app, to understand the execution. This is my future work, <laughs> and I have a slide at the end, but yes. So ideally what you would like to do is having this system that un understand the execution and, and then distill a report that give 
to back to the developer and then ask the, dev dev the developer, is it fundamental that you have this kind of code here or can, I, can you change a little bit? Yes. Uh, oh, yes. Yes, thank you for the question. Yes, it is the case. And it works with the same um, but, but for most application, you, you know when you write the code, you know the input and output more or less, and you know how to compute the distortion. So this is a requirement of the system. The developer has to provide this as well. Um, so yes. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> you, you also can do that, yes. Great question. Um, so, so here one problem is that this design speed explodes, right? It's exponential with this code region. And we are talking about thousands of sequential segments, so thousands of code regions. So how can we deal with that? We're talking about exploring a thousands dimensional space here. So I propose to prune this space aggressively, exponentially, by following an, an empirical observation I found, which is if you transform a given code region with a relaxing transformation. The performance impact of this transformation is limited within the loop that you apply to. By doing that, you exponentially cut down this design space. I'm gonna use an example to show that. If we have 50 loops, two code regions per loop, and two transformations per code region, the entire space is two to the 100. But if you prune it, instead of, instead of exploring a 100-dimensional space, you explore 50 two-dimensional spaces. Much more practical. So after all of this, one interesting question is, okay, how much performance we are talking about here and how much output distortion? So here you can see in the x-axis um, benchmarks, y-axis performance obtained in a real system, six score in Halem. You can see in BZIP2 that Helix doubles the performance as we saw at the beginning, but if you allow some relaxing transformations to be added into the compiler, you can see that you can boost to 5x on a six core. This was the result obtained when we set the maximum output distortion to be 10%. Sorry, yes. Thank you, and I have your answer. <laughs> yes, uh, so, so BZIP2 has two outputs. One, the compressed file and statistics about the compression. The compressed file, we don't tolerate any output distortion. It has to match perfectly. But statistics, we can tolerate. So instead of, of printing, you saved five bytes thanks to the compression, now we print, you saved seven bytes for the compression. And this is the 3.8% computed with this formula. Because these statistics are computed, are, the code to compute these statistics are deeply nested inside the code of the algorithm. Well, but then, then you have to redesign the code, the, the program completely. But this is, the way they do this is, is because you, you can have a light, light piece of code spread out all around to, to lightly compute the statistics. That's why they did it. Uh, yes, but right now it doesn't exist. And, and so this, the, 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 uh, this kind of approach is automatic, so. so. Not just the size, but I, will, I, will, I oversimplify. There is a size, but, uh, yeah, there is a size, and, and, but the components of the statistics are, are uh, inside this code are so deeply nested that the code is still there. So when you, when a, for a paralyzing compiler that works automatically, the only thing I will see is pointers that points to data structures that we compute I something there. But, but, so, 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 but here there is a trade-off. One, in one hand, you, you design the program exactly the way you want. On the other hand, you have a lot of sequential design programs that are out there and we use. And right now you don't have any solution for that. You run sequentially. 
this is to try to paralyze the program. So to go like above and, and go to there. But this has been done uh, uh, truly, like, like Require a much uh, yes yes okay yes I agree and it should be done and this is the that we should be doing but the problem is uh, uh, the, the reality is that we have a lot of this these programs so there is still a value to 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 transform them automatically of course if you have the time to take and redesign a little bit maybe with the help of a compiler. It requires time from the developer that some, some developers don't have. Thanks for the question. Yeah. So to do this, I designed um, uh, this uh, experiment. So here what I did is uh, I set different maximum amount of distortions, and then I run Helix up to show how this trade-off look like. And the first thing you notice is that clearly there is a big gap and you don't have any output distortion and you improve it. This is due to the conservativeness of the analysis. So in some way, this is the optimistic case for thread level speculation, where you don't pay any overhead of keeping track of what to do to roll back. And the rest is coming from actually changing the output. Thanks for the question. Uh, it depends on the benchmark, and you're right. Uh, and here I'm talking about distribution rather than single value. Yes, you're right. Uh, so it depends on the benchmark. I think in this case, it was less than one deviation from that. Get the number again. I think it was that. Great question. Um, so, so now that we have all of this system, what I did is I get excited about it and I wanted to improve it. So something I wanted to do is now applying these transformations at runtime. Because at runtime, you actually see what is going to happen. You see what the bottlenecks you have, and you, you know how, which dependencies you have and how to break them. So I designed a runtime co-design with this, this compiler that react to transient bottlenecks. So bottleneck that appear at some point and disappear a few, few, few iterations later. With this runtime, you can see that the first thing, we boost the performance on a six core from five to more than six, because we use also simultaneous multi-threading here, so two threads per core. But also, at the same out, it is for the same performance, we obtain it with less output distortion. And this and my, my Helix app compared. So I would like to thank, thank you for the attention. But before concluding, I would like you to give you three takeaways for the, these three parts of the talk. First, parallelism hides in small loops. We have to have the same. Second, irregularity in the code requires low latency. And finally, if you can tolerate some output distortions, you can really boost the parallelization. So what's next? interested on doing next is to take a look at the entire hardware software stack. And now, up to now, we just look at combining compiler with the architecture. But of course, there is a great value, as, as you pointed out before, to, to distill some kind of knowledge about the parallel execution and propagate it to the developer. And now the developer can use it to improve the code. Moreover, uh, looking at the Helix RC and Helix app performance, what I observed is they, the, both, the performance of both systems are limited right now because of real dependencies that exist because of data structure management or, or traversing a list, traversing a graph, a tree. So, but the compiler doesn't really understand this. 
The only thing the compiler sees is pointer chasing. Now think about Helix RC. These dependencies are real. You have to push the data around, but there is some limit of that because you still have a sequential segment that do this pointer chasing that limits the performance. On the other end, in Helix app, these dependencies, you cannot break them. If you try to break them, then suddenly the pointer will point to, I don't know where, catastrophic event. So both of them are limited by this. But this is not a fundamental limitation, right? We know how to structure the data, and we know how to access the files and trees and how to traverse them. The problem is that right now, the one in control of doing that is the developer. What I, what I would argue is that the one that is in charge to define the parallelism, to extract it, in this case the compiler, should be in charge of managing these data structures. And the reason is because extracting parallelism depends on how you store the data and how you manage it, and vice versa. How to store the data and manage it depends on which kind of parallelism we are talking about. The one is in charge of the first should be in charge of the latter. That's why what I'm very interested and passionate about now is to look at the stack and look at the interface between the programming language and the compiler to shift the control of data structure management from the programming language down to the compiler. And another thing I'm very interested about is to take a look at the stack and specialize it for specific domain that we have today that are growing faster and faster, like machine learning. This, I conclude the talk, and thank you for your attention. Like, like cash hierarchy or, or something like that. So um, that's a great question. Uh, we actually noticed these perturbations and the performance impact on the first invocations of these small loops. But then these are repeatedly invoked within another loop. So at some point, the cache hierarchy warm up. And then the fact. However, and also I would argue that this perturbation can be, this perturbation can be uh, managed in, with some prefetchers. That is, we already have prefetchers in hardware. But the way we distribute the code makes the, the work of prefetch or hardware prefetcher much harder. And we noticed that the, the amount of um, miss rate in the private cache L1 increased. Tied with the Helix app because we, we broke the data locality. Or also we make hardware So in some sense we need a specialized hardware prefetcher that to, to make this warming like faster. Oh, so yeah. oh, I see, I see. So, so uh, yes. Thanks for the question. So, an ongoing work is, is that we are doing right now is exactly this. For that, we are uh, rethinking a little bit about the interface between OS and and the the code or the architecture. <coughs> and the reason is because there are um, region of the execution of this kind of parallelization where we are very sensitive and region that we are not. So that's why we need a little bit of orchestration between the OS and, and the code. And this is what we are doing right now, and I hope we will submit something to Asplos, but we will see. Thanks for the question. Yes. Um. How hard it will be? Okay, so, uh, 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 we, we gave talks to, to, to me and also the, the big group, first to Intel, to try to convince them to actually do that because then I can, we can do so much more on, on the parallelization part. So uh, something they told us is that um, the problem is not the size of the ring cache. They say one kilobyte is more than fair. The problem is that uh, it complicates a little bit the design of the private cache L1 because 
accessing private cache L1 is in the critical path. So they must require, they, we, we need to keep that very fast. Now, adding this ring node increase a little bit. We have to put few transistors in between to, to decide where to forward the data. That can slow down a few percent the, the, uh, in the frequency, uh, uh, the critical path. And they said that could be one design problem. Uh, however, there are solutions for this. And one solution is to merge ring nodes in parallel and use them in different ways. However, we didn't simulate that. So I don't know the impact of that. About the power? Uh, every store within sequential segments. Yeah. Uh, uh, in terms of power, we don't, we didn't make any any measurement. We didn't simulate it. Um, yeah. Here, there is a trade-off between performance and power, and and. Uh, but Helix RC allow you to have this, to stretch this trade-off. Where you fit in the trade-off depends on the design. Thank you for the question. Okay, um, yes, 80%. And the reason, I, okay, so, so, but to do that, it wasn't easy because we had to design very specific data dependence analysis in the compiler. It took us more than two years. But if you do that, you can actually speed it, you can actually have this kind of accuracy. You still have 20% that are useless. Uh, 80% of the time you ship a piece of data that someone will use. Now I have a breakdown. <laughs> Let me see if I can find, yes, here we go. <laughs> okay, so, so this is the breakdown of, of the communication we have to handle. Uh, and so, so what happened here is, uh, I think this is the chart. Here shows the number of transactions that we can do to this generator. You can see that the majority of the data we generate are consumed by more than one core, right? So we're talking about a multicast communication channel here, not a single cast. So, so this is a big fraction. And also the distance of between producer and first consumer is shows that the majority of the communication is not between adjacent cores. Otherwise, we could have made a different design. Well, we look at this before designing the ring cache. Of course, this motivated the, the, the design that, that we showed. Uh, it could be a tree. It could be uh, the ring is just for simplicity. And, and it, quite, it works quite nicely in 16 cores. Thousand cores. Yes, maybe a ring is not the best topology. Uh, maybe having hierarchy of rings. Oh, thank you. No. And but we have to have the ring nodes. We have to have the right communication between the ring nodes to avoid that problem. To avoid that problem is uh, one, one of the uh, uh, constraint in the ring cache design was exactly to allow the rest of the memory hierarchy to be completely unaware of the ring cache. And here, we, this is how we handle it. For every point, for every uh, address, we, we, we have an hash function that maps that address to one specific ring node. That specific ring node is the only one in charge to storing value and to moving data back and forth from the ring cache level to the rest of the memory hierarchy. So for the rest of the memory hierarchy, you will see that that core, that ring node, is the only one that access that piece of data. Of course, this creates some overhead, but it allows us to avoid this complication because people don't want to redesign the cache clearance protocol and for good reason. Yes. Um, so, we were looking at Perl Bench, which is one of the bench ranks in this suite, that is a, a, is a virtual machine. Um, and um, uh, the speed up was, was for some of the loops because uh, we couldn't handle the entire code space for engineering reasons. Uh, the, for the one that we were able to handle, the speed up was around three, between three to four. 
Of course, that complicates the problem, right? Virtual machines uh, have unique problems, and, and they need to be handled, let's say, let me put it in this way, and, and, and yes. Uh, to for the ring cache. Um, uh, so, 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 so your question is if, if industry or, or, or uh, so, so Freescale considered to, to, to look at Helix part and we, 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 are, we are looking at that together. Uh, there are some constraints for that because they want to use their own for Quasar and, and some, some cases, some corner cases to be handled there. But Yes, they are very interested because they manage so many things because they have a large sequential code base and they don't know how to improve their performance. Yes. Yeah. So one of the things I, I I'm doing right now is is uh, taking all of this code, all of this the the, the compiler, uh, and the, right now is a prototype right, because. Now what I'm doing is I'm polishing the code and, and cleaning up a little in LLVM to then, sh in this way it can be publicly available. People can. What I would like to do is having a, a framework, a parallelization framework, where I, where I designed Helix, but it can be used for other ideas. In this way it's much easier to compare. Because right now, right now one of the problems that I faced is uh, each parallelizing compiler we proposed in the past are very complex. Somehow, somehow you can you know, take the, red, the, the other ideas and, and uh, smooth corners and compare them, but it's better to have a framework. See what I'm trying to obtain. Yes. Yes, um, I don't have results yet, but uh, the idea of Tylera uh, that we had is to, to test it is, so we have a set of cores, and you, you have a couple of ring cores that you can choose. One core will do the ring cache. The other, the adjacent core will do the ring, will mimic the ring cache. So then in this way you can, actually, you can mimic, the, the, and this is what I'm trying to do. But also another thing we do, so I'm working with a very talented student to do Helix RC in FPGA. So, so we we uh, we actually have it right now and we tested. It's uh, it's it matched the, the, the results we have, uh, more or less. Of course, there is some some few percent here and there. Um, we but we use uh, um, uh, Leon cores, not not Intel Atom. But yeah, we did that. We did only for four cores though, because we couldn't we couldn't fit in the FPGA. But. is my hope. Yeah. Uh, right now, I'm, I, I specifically avoid that problem. <laughs> uh, uh, if you, I feel that if you have a multi-socket machine, the best way is to have, look at the parallelism across rather than across iterations within a small loop. Because then in this way you can have, you can take advantage of the nesting parallelism between the loops nested within each other to be more latency tolerant when you go across the socket. That I feel would be, that, that's my feel. 